And uh, I will introduce our topic today uh, right now. In professional and personal situations alike, the ability to present an effective argument is, an, is a valuable asset. Whether negotiating for a pay increase or influencing the media on behalf of an organization, the skill of persuasion is useful no matter the career or the situation. So today our panel representing nonprofit and government affairs media relations are going to offer participants advice and tactics on building a persuasive argument. Today we are very fortunate to be joined by two outstanding Pitt alum. First, I would like to introduce Darren Ellerby. Uh, since 2017, Darren has been the inaugural director of the Community Engagement Center located in Homewood. Homewood, as you all know, is a historic African-American neighborhood within P Pittsburgh's East End. Uh, prior to this role, Darren was a community affairs and equity strategist for the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Pittsburgh. Uh, in her current role as community engagement professional, she leads Pitt's community engagement uh, in the Homewood community, ensuring alignment with the university's neighborhood commitments uh, and our expressed community goals. She's a convener, a coalition builder. She leverages strengths-based approaches which cultivate mutually beneficial outcomes between the university and the community. She steers, builds, and maintains relationships towards reciprocity recognizing that resources, that the resources pit, uh, of Pitt combined with the wisdom of the community can bring about social change. Darren is a 2004 graduate from Pitt's Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences. We are also pleased to be joined by Bill Pierce. Uh, Bill is a 1982 graduate, graduate from the Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences and a 1985 graduate from Pitt's Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. He is currently a senior director at APCO Worldwide. APCO is an advisory and advocacy com communications consultancy that helps organizations uh, become catalysts for progress and navigating the challenges of today. Uh, in his role, he specializes in providing strategic advice and counsel, tactical execution and representation, representation to healthcare clients. Um, previously, Bill, uh, served as the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Public Affairs at the Department of Health and Human Services, where he was senior spokesperson for the department and uh, advised and counseled all HHS and its agencies, including the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the Food and Drug Administration, and the National Institutes of Health and the Center for Disease Control and Pre Prevention. Bill brings a wide array of media relations and stakeholder engagement experience, and we are very pleased to have him here as well. So I'm gonna kick it off with a question for you both. Um, that sort of comes from the, the marketing materials for today's, uh, for today's session. Um, as you both think about your roles, which are very different roles, but there are many commonalities here. Um, you are charged with interfacing with groups that have a notion of the university's reputation. I'm going to start with Darren. Mm -hmm. uh, Darren, you are charged with interfacing with groups that already have a notion of the university's reputation. And a key part of your work is ensuring that our relationships are strengthened. As you approach your work, and I'm going to Turn this over to Bill a little bit later. So I want you to think about this too, Bill. Mm -hmm. What are the things that you have found most valuable as you bring that engagement to the community on behalf of the university as you engage with these important stakeholders? Thank you, Ellen. Uh, so for me, one of the things that I feel like uh, bring value uh, to the work of the community engagement centers and my work in particular as I build relationships on behalf of Pitt is uh, transparency. Uh, in Homewood, as well as in the Hill District and other uh, Pittsburgh communities, uh, Pitt's reputation uh, depends on the person, right? Um, and in some of those communities, um, we've had to communicate a pivot 
from um, past uh, approaches, um, approaches in which residents, uh, many of whom um, have uh, interacted with Pitt in one way, shape or form, but um, approaches that um, see uh, institutions um, like Pitt researching on communities instead of collaborating with communities. So, um, you know, leveraging um, transparency and acknowledging the past and the pivot has been extremely important to me in building relationships. Um, in addition, uh, language is important. The words that we're using um, to describe um, Pitt's neighborhood commitments, for, for instance, and um, showing the action behind that language is equally um, as important too, uh, because many communities, particularly uh, minoritized communities like what you'll see in Homewood uh, in the Hill District, they're used to institutions saying one thing but doing something else. And I feel like uh, the university's community engagement efforts um, have, um, have been well received because um, we're not only saying we're doing things in an asset framed way, but we're showing, um, showing it too through our actions and um, the conveners or the people that we have at the table that I assist in convening, um, the coalitions that are being built and, and so forth. Um, so to me, just being authentic, um, being transparent, leveraging the, the right relationships and saying, look, um, this, we know that this happened in the past. How can we move forward? Um, how can we pivot away um, from those, um, those past interactions so that we see thriving for all of us through these engagements? And that wakes me up every morning, Ellen. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Darren. That's awesome. So I've taken away a couple of big, you know, big words, you know, big points from what you've just said, transparency. I also picked up, you know, that you're trying to show a pivot or change, uh, which is a, which really requires the art of persuasion when you've got um, stakeholders who have sort of their minds made up or a preconceived notion of what, uh, what they think. Um, and, and that the, your language and your credibility really matters. Um, I'm going to turn to Bill now because I think that some of those key points are translatable throughout, but I'd love your perspective in your work uh, on kind of what works for you and what are the hallmarks of persuasion in, uh, in your work at APCO. Uh, thanks, Ellen. And over your career, actually. And, and Darren, th thank you. So uh, I'm going to build on things that Darren said because there are a lot of similarities. Um, one of the most important things, if, if a client comes to to us uh, and looks for help, particularly about their reputation, is to understand. Our, so, so the first thing is one: do they have reputation at all? We get lots of organizations that have virtually none and they want to establish it, particularly in the Washington media market. And then others have a reputation that could be good or bad, but they want to enhance it in a certain way. They want to change it. They want to, we'll want to expound on a, on a particular point of it uh, in, the, uh, in the arena. So what, what's one of the most important things to start off with in any case is, so who do you want to talk to? Who's your audience? Who are these people? In the old days, and I'm old enough to have been around for those old days, our tools were very, very limited in this area. But nowadays with media sliced and diced so many ways and with uh, organizations uh, and the audiences sliced and diced so many ways, you, have, you can be very specific and use some very specific tools to do these kinds of things. So number one is, 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 is who do you wanna to talk to? And, and of course, you know, Darren, you talked about uh, uh, something when you said words matter and this was, this was, or that was my translation of it, but this was something that, that made me think oftentimes when I'm talking to, to clients is, it goes to right to the audience is, so there are the words you will speak, but what is it, will they, what will they actually hear? What's their takeaway message? What are they gonna walk away with? So that's why those words matter. Cause if you use some wrong words for certain audiences, they might hear differently than you hear. So it's really important to understand that, that um, interaction between actual words and messages, because that's the thing that comes across 
uh, in someone's brain. It's the picture they paint of what you're trying to say. And it can be different between your audiences. So you need to know and understand, uh, again, in the Washington marketplace, you know, we've got several really big audiences. We've got members of Congress, we have staff, we have executive branch, we have the regulatory world, we have the thought leader community, and we have the advocacy community in the really big buckets. So who are you trying to talk to? But when you craft those things, because the way the world's interacted these days um, are interconnected, you, you can't say a different message over here to over there. It, w- it will be found out. You cannot literally talk out of both sides of your mouth as the old saying goes. So you have to figure out if I'm going to say something slightly different to this group, it's got to be credible if heard by also by the group over here. And that's a really big challenge. So those are, those are some important things when you're crafting reputation and working on reputation is audience, who are we talking to? What do you want to say? What is it you want to say? Um, and then how do we actually craft it? What kind of tools do we use? And then, uh, Darren, you said something really important is transparency. Um, the first thing I look at, so like if I get some message, some email, some advertisement I see about something, or even someone contacts me and says, we need your help, I go right to their website. If I can't figure out in about two seconds who this is, who's behind it, and who's where's the money coming from, I'm very suspicious. So when, when particularly because I deal with a lot of media every day, if I'm coming on behalf of an organization that's doing something to the media, I'm going to right away to answer all those questions because then that removes a lot of suspicion, right? There's no story that says, oh, this organization is really a front group for that. I'm just going to tell them. And sometimes it makes clients uncomfortable, but I'm like, this is the best thing you can do. Be transparent. If you believe this is true, what you want to do, be transparent about it. Um, and then you're going to take out, they're never going to ask a question again. And they don't. So a transparency is really important as we do it. And you have to know when to reveal, but it is really important in this business because otherwise you can create a story that you just don't want to create about yourself. And there goes your, your reputation. Um, the other thing about reputation that's interesting is to know and understand what you can change and what you cannot change. Using the pharmaceutical industry as an example, as an individual pharmacy company, there are things about your reputation you can deal with. But there are things about the entire industry that will be very difficult for any one company to deal with. And you just have to understand that. So you have to also then target correctly. So those are just a few thoughts. I know we're going to go down this path quite a bit more. Those are just a few thoughts to where I, where I start from. Right. No, that that's great, Bill. Uh, I, I think you really hit on a lot of important facets of this. Darren, do you, uh, do you want to add to that a little bit in terms of you know, some of what Bill talked about? Uh, you know, in terms of reputations that are already sort of, you know, established versus not established. And I think actually there might be an analog to pit here locally in that there are facets of Pitt's reputation that are longstanding and, um, and maybe they're correct or maybe they need to be um, communicated differently. But they're also, you know, Pitt is evolving. And is doing some new things, and there are uh, there are uh, opportunities for new reputational um, uh, y- imperatives uh, that that you're working on right now. Yes. Uh, first of all, Bill, you dropped so many nuggets. Um, I, I almost feel like I can't uh, speak after you at this moment. So thank you. <laughs> I'm learning so much. Um, and it got me excited. I think only uh, communications nerds would get excited about what Bill just said. Um, so with that being said, uh, I think about um, the longstanding reputation of the University of Pittsburgh, right? And then this new world that we're in and the power of storytelling. Uh, in telling the story and closing loops. Um, One example that comes to mind is a a few years ago, and I won't go into a lot of detail, but um, the process that the the students and the faculty and the staff went through to change the name of Perrin Hall. Um, 
Right. So uh, I remember being uh, in the community. I can't remember if the center was open yet or if we were still renovating, but um, but people wanted to know about Pitt being a research institution and um, they connected um, the Tuskegee study to the university and Dr. Perrin worked on the Tuskegee study. Um, now, what residents didn't realize at that time is that on campus, there was already a movement and an initiative by faculty, staff, and students um, to change the name of Perrin Hall. So I could very proudly, not only as a representative of Pitt, but as an alum, have conversations with residents and say, we're pivoting, and this is proof um, of the pivot. It's one thing, but we're moving in the right direction. Why don't you join us? Um, it allowed me to do a strong call to action um, to help build that coalition that I'll continue to, to bring up, committed to thriving. So with that being said, thinking about um, Pitt's, uh, you know, reputation the good things and the not so good things, right? Which I think is a testament of the times when you're thinking about an institution that's been around since 1787 um, to where we are now with Dr. Gallagher uh, and this commitment through um, our uh, new team, engagement in community affairs and this commitment throughout the entire university and in our strategic plan. We have this opportunity to close those loops and to tell the story Story and again, show the action behind it, unlike ever before. Um, so hopefully I answered uh, your question there, Ellen. Yeah, and Darren, I'd actually like to uh, add on to that um, and note that when you took this role, I doubt, I think, but I don't know, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, you were not thinking that renaming an academic building in, and the process through which that might happen over uh, you know, uh, controversy that is decades old mm -hmm. was not probably part of what you thought you would be working on or utilizing, but, uh, or, or would even come to the fore in your work. But I think it is really a good example of um, where you're engaging stakeholders. And we've talked a lot about words, mm -hmm. but actions matter. Yes. And when you have a proof point, even if it is not central to how the university engages with the community, it is relevant to how the university engages with the community. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, you know, what happened with the renaming of that building um, and the process that we went through. And in indeed, we took comments, uh, as I recall, uh, from all stakeholders, yep. you know, including community members. So, uh, so I think you bring up uh, an excellent point, and I assume that that process probably helped you. Um, it in did. Your work with it absolutely did. And um, what comes to mind is, um, you know, some of those conversations I had to have on the ground in Homewood pertaining to this, right? Um, you know, I could have taken um, a question like that um, down a different road of, um, you know, um, transitioning from um, an advocacy standpoint saying, look, this is, the, our, we have a building named Heron Hall. We're familiar with the Tuskegee study and the wrongs behind that and institutions all over the world have taken steps um, to ensure that never happens again. Um, and now we have this community movement to change the name. That means something. Um, so I, I, I took a, that point to as an opportunity to advocate for change compared to getting into an argument and getting defensive with a person. And I also feel like that has helped me tremendously in building authentic and genuine relationships in the community. I've always just been concerned about people. Um, you could, uh, I'm a Pittsburgh, Southwestern Pennsylvania girl, so you could call it maybe nosiness or nebbiness. Um, but I always want to know what's happening in the, in the lives of, of folks. And I genuinely love meeting people. People. So building authentic and genuine relationships means something to me because those will carry you throughout whatever your title is. Those relationships will carry you for life. And it took me some time to, to, to learn that. I definitely learned it in this position. Right. So integrity, 
honesty, transparency, and action, proof points, right, are some of the, the hallmarks of, of what we've learned here. Another theme that's emerging in this is, uh, you know, we're talking about controversial topics, right? Mm -hmm. And um, and Cassie put a, a question in the chat uh, too about, you know, holding firm to an argument and your viewpoint uh, with a group that might not be that open to it, uh, or maybe even tends to shut down in it. And I think, you know, something that we've been touching on and we talked about before the panel uh, that I'd like to get into is really, uh, and Darren, you've been sort of speaking to this, understanding and having a connection with your audience. Bill, in your work, mm -hmm. uh, those relationships are maybe longstanding, you know, because you've been at this for a while, but mm -hmm. less personal, right? Yeah, um, most of, yeah. So yeah, how, how have you built on this over time and, and how, is, uh, how much of a factor has that been for you? Yeah, so uh, a couple of thoughts. And again, I, I think the, the, the key parts are, um, and you know, I have been involved in some really contentious stuff. And, and also now, you know, we do a lot of work in the, the space regarding vaccination and, and not only about COVID, but, but for 12 years, the whole idea around vaccination safety in general um, and, you know, some of what we're seeing now is not a new phenomenon. So part of it is, is the acknowledgement that, that most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time, the other side, the, the folks you're trying to talk to perhaps that don't agree with you, is the acknowledgement that there is some intellectual legitimacy to what, what point of view they have. So when you, if you look at vaccination, for example, um, th there are, there is some that's, that's, there is no legitimate or intellectual legitimacy to the position, but actually that's a smaller percentage than the, than the other part. And that is because they've had a bad experience personally in the past, because there is a historical issues, you mentioned Tuskegee, that's pretty big stuff that, that for the African-American community was a, was a, a pretty big um, stumbling block, though, frankly, that the community in a big way has moved beyond it because there's some pretty high numbers, certainly where I live around here, pretty high numbers when it comes to African-American and being vaccinated. Um, uh, and, and then there are some people who are just frankly scared. So some of it is, is when you have these debates is you have to acknowledge that it's perfectly legitimate to hold the position, the other position over there is perfectly legitimate. So what we're discussing then is not the legitimacy of this issue. What we're discussing is why do we want the, the population at large to get vaccinated as the example? What are the reasons to do this? There are personal and there are community. So let's talk about that. That's what we should talk about. Um, and so, um, because that's the biggest majority. So to me, that a lot of credibility, your personal credibility can be built up by saying, look, because uh, I don't see argument. That's a different thing than persuasion and advocacy. It's not, they're not the same things. I don't want to have an argument with you. I do want to engage in advocacy and persuasion. And we may or may not come to an agreement, but, uh, and there are a lot of issues that are like that. Um, I work on a ton of them and I'm happy to chat about any of them, but um, that's one of the most important thing is this acknowledgement is this not rejection of the other side, just out of hand. There's far too much of that in the world these days where people literally to use that horrible word cancel. That's awful. And it, it should stop. And everybody does it. I don't care who you are. It gets done right, left and middle, and it needs to stop. And what we need to say is, okay, what is your, problem here? What's your question here? What's your challenge? Why don't you agree with this? And then, and then you can go from there. And I think you're, you're, again, some people are never going to get there and they're going to do what they're going to do. And that's it. You ignore them. Um, but to me, that's really a fundamental point uh, in all of this is to understand that point and understand that issue quite well. And if you can do that, I think it's much easier to move forward. Well, yes, and I think you know, Bill. What you're referring, what you seem to be touching on too, is um, 
you know, we live in a social media world and in a, a hyper polarized political world where the sides are really talking past each other mm-hmm. to their own audiences, mm-hmm. right? When you see the, the, you know, the arguments that are thrown back and forth in Washington, and it certainly takes place here locally um, at all levels, um, you know, uh, it, calling someone a liar or, or right. they, you know, it, it's really not meant to persuade anybody on the other side. It's meant to kind of rev up your mm-hmm. own side, right? And um, what both you and Darren are charged with doing in very different realms is getting past that mm-hmm. and meeting people where they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, uh, so yeah, I think um, your points about um, acknowledging where the audience is coming from, exactly. whether or not it's an intellectual argument that they have or an emotional argument or fear based on, you know, based on very legitimate historical, mm-hmm. you know, predecessors to yep. where we are today, mm-hmm. it's all real. Yep. Yep. And, and again, that's, that's almost true for every issue we deal with. One of the other things I would add, and it, it kind of goes to the question that was asked in the chat or in the Q&A is um, what's really important if you're going to be engaged in that or you're coaching people who are engaged in that is what I call don't take the bait. So when they, if the other side throws out uh, the words that we know are bait words, because they're all, their goal is to, Ellen, as you said, to, 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 to really talk past one another, but just to score points with their own audience. Just don't take the bait. Just nothing more frustrating than when the other side throws the bait down and you just step right over it. That makes them crazy. And, and then they can't do anything at that point. You step over it and engage. There are some people in this world who are very, very, very good at that. Uh, one of the examples I use, it comes out of the the medical science world is Tony Fauci. He doesn't take bait. And he's been doing this for 40 years. I, I've seen him doing this for years, decades. So it's not just this current debate. It's he's, he's, He did it during the AIDS crisis. People forget he was once burned in effigy. And now he's one of the AIDS community's most respected communicators, researchers, doctors, because he never took the bait. He just focused on the issue and listen to his audience and it worked out. So uh, that's my advice. Don't take the bait. <laughs> okay, so let's, let's, I wanna explore that a little bit. And Darren, I wanna uh, you know, ask you a follow on to this. Um, we've all been in that situation where people you know, maybe don't appear to be hearing you and uh, you need to sort of get past uh, you know, a hurdle um, and, uh, how do you get past that? And is that, uh, has that been something that you've had to reckon with in your community work? Um, uh, and do you deal with, uh, stakeholders who are fed misinformation? Um, and has that been an issue and how have you dealt with that? All right, so I will start with the the latter question around uh, misinformation. Um, You probably know, many of you on the call, uh, that the university opened a disinformation lab um, this year. And um, I've had numerous discussions um, with our colleagues um, leading uh, the disinformation labs efforts in pit cyber. Um, and we are currently, um, you know, looking and seeking funding so that we can approach um, community audiences in the East End, teaching them about dis- dif- disinformation, excuse me, uh, and um, doing research and, and so forth. 
I say that to say that um, this idea of fake news and disinformation, both online uh, and in the media, it's been problematic uh, for me and my role engaging uh, the community, as well as um, I would like to say also engaging university audiences. I know that my work is um, very uh, community public facing, uh, but I am just as committed to um, being responsive, responsive to faculty, staff, and students at Pitt as I am about being um, responsive to residents, government uh, um, elected officials, uh, and other community stakeholders. So I say all of that to say that I have had uh, conversations or been pulled into Facebook um, battles um, where uh, residents have posted um, questioning Pitt's role in the community, questioning whether the university is ushering in gentrification and so forth. Mm -hmm. The way I've handled those sorts of um, situations is um, early on, I would just um, slide into a DM, um, do a direct message and um, ask for for a meeting and um, meet that person for some coffee. Of course, this was like the pre-COVID days where we could, we could freely do this. Um, I would invite them to the Everyday Cafe in Homewood and have a conversation. Uh, and many times people were not aware of the university's um, commitment. They were not aware of um, the university's um, role and how we were filling gaps through the centers. They just looked at us as a big institution coming in to take over. I say that because I believe meeting people where they are, looking them in the face and um, being accessible to answer those questions about gentrification and so forth, access um, was very important, continues to be. But I was able to build relationships with people, which resulted in um, a, a couple of years ago, even if that, uh, we had uh, someone post on uh, Facebook, and I was, of course, tagged in the post. And um, I saw that many residents and community stakeholders alike swooped in, and I didn't even really have to respond. They responded saying, have you walked into the center, sir? You know they'll let you in the tour. Have you asked questions? And um, I used that as an example. Um, it really gave me wings knowing that um, we're making a difference. We're building the relationships where folks from the community felt comfortable with um, coming to Pitt's defense, so to speak, but really, um, you know, educating that particular community member to say, you are empowered to walk through those doors and ask the staff, staff there, what are you doing here? And what do you have for me and my family? And, tr and, and to say, trust us, we've done it. And they answered our questions and we've gone back. Um, so, um, so as it relates to disinformation, I continue to deal with it and I continue to just make myself accessible, my staff accessible, and of course, um, encourage folks to come down to the center and see for themselves. Now, the, the question related to, I think you were talking about um, handling situations where I feel like someone's not listening. Um, that happens. And I, I, I truly believe it depends on the context. So for instance, if I'm um, leading a discussion in which I'm, and this has happened, maybe not so much in this role, but when I work for the city, um, around equity and inclusion and social justice, and I'm the only person at the table that looks like me. Um, I sort of communicate in a way that um, might make people uncomfortable. And when I feel that uncomfortableness, I'll say, look, we need to pause and sit in it because we're at the precipice of change and change doesn't it. feel good. Um, and I, I, I also feel like cancel culture um, is an easier side of, is an easy side effect from mm -hmm. cognitive dissonance. Like, so when anyone is approached with anything that they don't believe that goes against their belief system, it's easier to, 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 to um, cancel the, the messenger out instead of really sitting in the information that they're providing and thinking about it. And it may not necessarily change the way that you feel, the way that you were brought up and what you believe, um, but at least learn about it and be open to it um, and grow from it. And um, so I encourage in my discussions, um, whether it's with the city or even now, to sit in that uncomfortable feeling, sit in that um, cognitive dissonance and push through because on the other end, we'll all be stronger and better equipped as a result of it.
So hopefully that that's answered right. uh, the questions. <laughs> that's great. And since uh, that's great, Darren, thank you. And um, you've built a little platform for us to pivot because we've gotten some questions from uh, our audience here. Um, and uh, what I'm seeing is uh, we want to pivot a little bit more into the personal advocacy um, uh, realm. And uh, I'm going to kick that part off with um, an observation or, or building on what you were just talking about, Darren. And, and Bill, you've uh, had uh, a lot of experience in this as well. And that is in advocating yourself, I think some of those uh, benchmarks of know your audience, know what's important to them. But if you're asking for a raise or asking for something or trying to uh, have a new arrangement at work uh, or even in your personal life, um, you know, how do you engage those audiences? I do think the what we've talked about uh, in stakeholder engagement still rings true. Mm -hmm. You got to know what's on their mind, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, but I will say something that we have been impacted by as a society is that we have fewer and fewer of these conversations in person anymore. Mm -hmm. And I think there are generational divides there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I think uh, learning how to bridge that conversation gap um, is, is really important. Um, and so Bill, you know, I know, uh, uh, you've been at this a while. How have things changed over time and what have you wow. learned about, you know, kind of advocating for oneself in the workplace and right. how to approach those conversations and Darren, I'm going to get to you as well, of course, but yeah. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely has changed tremendously. But on the other hand, it's not. And you touched on the, the parts that, that have not changed. I mean, the funny thing is, is, so I work in a very young industry, right? The, the, the public affairs industry, we've got an office. We've got, I don't know, a thousand people around the world. Our office in DC is 225 people. Um, I'd say at least half are under the age of 30. Uh, and probably three quarters are under the age of 40. So, um, and the funny part was, is, so we moved into a new office. It had that open office space stuff, very few offices, mostly open space. And I would see my young colleagues, they would all be sitting around a desk. Uh, it might've been a high, a high table. It might've been like a, a booth. It could have been a room with bean bags in it. We've got all those things that are, you know, and they would all have their earbuds in and they'd all have their laptop and they were working on different projects. They weren't working on the same thing, but they wanted to work together. And I would frequently come up and like tap them on the shoulder because I wanted to talk to them. And they would look at me like, oh my gosh, that's crazy. What's going on? Well, I would call them on the phone. And um, so, so that interpersonal communication has definitely changed over the years in a way that I don't think is so good. Um, I think we should, the more of what we have, the better off we are. It's much more difficult to tell somebody, um, frankly, to, to, to be mean and nasty to somebody if you're going to look them in the face, number one. Number two, it is hard to have a direct conversation with somebody, perhaps an employee who you need to have that with, than it is over email, but it will be much more effective and much more um, less open to interpretation. So I'm an advocate for that. And so like I have all, so, so if you're gonna, but, but, but what remains is if you're gonna ask for that raise, we can ask for a new office. If you're gonna ask for a, you wanna start That's to fine. manage people, uh, yeah. something you have got to know, ask the right person. That's number one. Um, and number two, you've got to have your argument, you know, if you will, well built. You you've got to put yourself in their shoes and say, okay, why why would I give this person a raise, right? It's the same thing I do if I'm talking to a reporter. I need to put myself in their shoes. Why would I write this story? Right. 
what is the story? So I need to, to make sure I've got that all buttoned up. It's the same thing in interpersonal. You have to have it buttoned up. It's far better to do it in person, however. Far better to do it in person. Once you develop those personal relationships and you've, you've done those discussions, it's then easier to do stuff via Zoom, via the phone, via email. Um, but, but when I see a new reporter I want to meet, I almost, even in the, in the COVID age that we're in, I almost always try to figure out how can we get together? Let's go have a coffee outside somewhere because it's really important to look at people and see people uh, when you're doing these kinds of things. And it's the same thing in those work conversations when you're trying to advocate for yourself. I think that's just critically important to do. Right. Um, it's just, we lose something if we don't. It sort of comes down to, you know, why do I get you to do something that I want you to do for your reasons? Not yes. Mine. Yes, right. exactly. What are your reasons? Right, right. And when what, you talk right. about making an argument, it's not like I want to have a fight with you. This is no, 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 but it's your, right, exactly. Uh, you again, doing? I use yeah. examples of media. I'm like, I need to know what are the last 10 stories you wrote? Well, if I'm asking you to write a story that's not in line with that, I've got a big leap to make there. But if it's it, if I pick the right person, it's going to be a follow-on of what work you've done. So therefore, it's not going to be hard for you to, think, yeah, that's a good idea. And then I'm going to give you the whole story. Here's people to talk to. Here's the narrative. Da, 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 da. Boom. Again, if I'm asking for something from my boss, it's the same thing. I need to make sure I understand what's going on in their world. Are seven people asking for raises? Are no one asking for a raise? Did no one, you know, I need to know that. It's really, really important. And then timing is everything. Right. So, Right. Do it in the morning, no, by the way, before 12 noon, whatever it is. <laughs> no, really helpful. Darren, I'm going to, I'm going to put a twist on this one. Okay. Uh, that maybe you and I can do a little back and forth on. Uh, and that is because we have a question uh, coming in from the audience. Um, persuasion skills for women. Hmm. And how is it different? So uh, I'll take a stab and just say, having been at this for a while, yeah, it is probably different. Um, I will also say things are changing. Yeah. Have they changed enough? Meh. <laughs> but they are changing. Um, do you, uh, so what has worked for you and, and how have you encountered this? And, and I'll, I'll chime right in. <laughs> okay, so this this question um, is interesting in that it has me thinking back to my childhood and how I used to persuade my father to do what I needed him to do. Um, <laughs> that could be an extra allowance. Um, that could be allowing me to spend the night over a cousin's house. Um, but over time, and my mom helped me with this, um, but over time, I was able to pretty much get what I wanted for my dad. Now, of course, he probably just did it because he loved me, right? I like to think that. But um, I knew, and um, Will uh, or Bill mentioned this timing is everything, but I would plant the seeds for what I wanted. Mm -hmm. as, for a, a week or two weeks before the ask, um, literally. <laughs> um, so I leveraged that methodology now, um, being a woman in, in the workplace, uh, having to persuade other women and men alike um, to do something that I need them to do. Um, and I prefer to, to, to I, I was also a cheerleader when I was younger as well. So I prefer a team approach. Um, let's, let's build some buy-in in a coalition of people because together we're stronger and whatever we want to do, whatever our, our argument is, is stronger together. At the table though, in the boardroom, when I know that I'm not the only woman in the room and there may be, um, because I believe the question was asked in the way, um, when you work in the male dominated environment and when I was at the city, it, it, it felt very male dominated. Um, it might only be two or three women in the room. I, I made sure um, to, and I still do this to this day, I make sure to include their voices. Um, I, my voice might be the one um, saying, um, I agree with so-and-so. Um, 
and providing that level of backup to one another to, to almost help all of our voices be heard. And then last but not least, I love the power of a good email. <laughs> So, um, you know, those verbal conversations and interactions, those are fine, but I almost like to memorialize over an email if there was an agreement made just to have something written that we can look at and sink our teeth into. And I think all of those things um, help. And then uh, I'll add this as a, um, a um, just one additional point. And then Ellen, I'll be interested to hear what you have to, to add. Um, but uh, in addition to doing all of, all of those things, I like to think that um, in, mass, in my master's program, I actually studied um, gender miscommunication in the workplace. Um, so I always can think back to what I learned at that point in my life. And there's little things that women tend to do in the workplace that men, or at least at that point in time, really weren't known for. So one thing that I learned was head nodding. Um, women will head nod as um, a sign of, um, I hear you. It may not necessarily be a sign of agreement. It's just that I'm here in the conversation with you. Whereas men will see a head nod as agreement. So I've worked very hard in conversations with men not to become a bobblehead. Don't be a bobblehead. Ellen? Darren, I've been a bobblehead. <laughs> <laughs> but I am agreeing with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, look, it's, uh, this is, I think for uh, women who aspire to lead um, and persuade, this is uh, an ongoing work. And I think um, finding what works for you, and I have seen many different women with many different styles. I you know, what has worked for you obviously then becomes natural to you. Um, and I would urge, um, you know, the, those in the audience who are sort of trying on different, different methods, um, there are uh, many, many different ways. Is it a level playing field? I would still argue, no, particularly mm -hmm. if you are in an unbalanced um, uh, arena. Let me also say, though, uh, reputation, getting back to our original part here, knowing your reputation and knowing what people perceive or what, what sort of your credibility is in the conversation helps. Um, and because if I'm going to comment on something that is in my area expertise, I have more credibility than if it's something that I know less about. Um, but uh, but really what I want to pivot to is age and experience does eventually help. And I don't know that that's actually a gender thing, <laughs> mm -hmm. that, that's just true across the board. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so eventually uh, you know, you find your style. There are many different styles. There is a very, for those of you who are interested, there is very, if you want need for the women who need comic relief, um, there is a very funny, um, a uh, column in that was printed in the Washington Post, ugh, I want to say five or six years ago, called Woman in a Meeting. And it takes all the great statements of men, not all of them, but many of the great statements of men over the course of history and how a woman in a meeting would say them. And it really points to the problem of how women portray themselves sometimes or how they dance around to try to maintain their credibility, but also not be shut down by the room um, and, and really does sort of underscore the challenge. So uh, as, as something for a little comic relief. Um, again, uh, what, uh, what I would say has worked for me is being direct, honest. For me, this is just me, uh, taking a pause and thinking about what is it that is at the crux of what I need to say here as opposed to all of the other stuff that might be swirling around in the conversation, because you really have to get right to it. Um, and again, that's not a, that, that, is, that is something I've had to train myself to do. Uh, uh, and, um, and that has helped me become more effective um, in conversations and in meetings. So I hope that's helpful. 
Um, I'm going to ask Cassie, are there, a, oh, there is one more question here. Um, are there certain keywords or phrases to use or not to use in argumentative si situations? Um, a good wrap up question are, are, what are you reading? Or are there some things uh, that, that we would recommend? Let's start with the first one. Uh, certain keywords or phrases to use or not to, not to uh, use in argumentative situations. I think if you're actually trying to persuade someone, I'll start with saying you're wrong. Those are kind of fighting words. Yeah. If you want to be in a fight, okay, you're wrong. Right. <laughs> that is wrong. <laughs> I might say that to my brother or my kid, <laughs> but, or my spouse. <laughs> I, th I think... But, I think, but yeah, Bill, yeah. what do you think? It's it's phrases that are very um, can only be interpreted one way. Absolutely. So you're wrong. I'm right. Yes. No. Um, that's ridiculous. I mean, so anything that clearly um, or minimizes or trivializes. Right. Minimizes, trivializes, pack back somebody into a corner, things of that nature. All all mistakes you should never make. Um, I, I do a lot of media coaching, and so that's exactly what we talk to people about is, is there are three ways, I give the example, there are three ways to say, to affirmatively respond to a question. Yes, that's true, or I cannot disagree with that. Those are all affirmative responses, but they are all, one is definitive, no wiggle room. Yes, that's true. That is broader, and I cannot disagree with that, is a very broad way to say an affirmative statement, but it provides you with wriggle room. So I think that's the key. Those are the things, it's not so much the exact words to avoid, because that's not the point. It's anything that trivializes, minimalizes, is very narrowly defined, backs people into a corner, because if you're trying to persuade, that's never going to work. You, you've, you've, you've just undercut your own self and you're done. I would add uh, anything that is inflammatory um, and uh, please, and I'm sure everyone knows this, but I'll, I'll say it, um, please do not name call. I'd like to think that anything where you're like, you could point at someone and say it where you're, you know, remember three fingers are pointing back at you too. And really, <laughs> truly argumentative discussions. I, I love asking questions because I feel mm -hmm. like asking questions, you could get to like the root of whatever it is that's causing like this tension or angst in the room. Um, but yeah, that's, that's how I, I, I try to uh, get through to, to people in those instances. Right. Well, and I'll, I'll go a step further. Accusing someone of lying. Yeah. Uh, or, or saying that something is a lie, uh, or, you know, uh, again, brings a whole, and, and that I think really jumps the lane into then, you know, you're really not trying to persuade the person or argue with or, or, or make a case to the person. You're talking to your own audience Mm -hmm. uh, you know, or to yourself, um, with almost no hope for impact, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, you know, saying something's not true is very different than saying something a lot. Right. I think, yeah. um, all right. Uh, is there anything, um, uh, that you all, uh, would refer to as a good read on this topic. Um, <laughs> I, I don't. Um, I don't find no is the answer. Uh, experience is the best teacher. Um, I think watching good people deliver remarks, watching good people engage when it comes to, and again, if you wanna be a professional at this, um, stay away from, from most political shows and that kind of stuff, they're, they're, they're pretty much worthless. Um, so, uh, because they, they're talking to their audiences. Um, so, but, but uh, I also read a lot of uh, biography and history of great, of people who've made differences in the world. So I recommend that kind of reading, right? So it's to read about 
these people who made these huge differences, you'll learn a lot. And it'll be a lot about how to communicate because that's mostly the way they're, they're being successful. Um, the only other thing I was going to add, which is something we, we kind of touched on, which is if you, particularly if you get into my business, right? Or Ellen's old business of politics, right? So if you're in the politics or the advocacy business in particular, you're going to be confronted with situations where sometimes you do not agree with what you're being asked to perhaps advocate for. And not uncommon. It's, it, I don't think it's possible to, to, to not have that occur sometimes in your career. And again, in the one situation I was asked, well, will, what won't you do? Tobacco, boom, I'm done. I won't do that. Um, some other things have arisen, which I have, I have, I have uh, also declined to, to advocate for. It, all based on credibility, because I couldn't go to the press with these things because they would go on. Huh. But sometimes in politics, in particular, when I worked in the Bush administration um, at HHS, I was asked to do a couple of things that I personally didn't agree with. But what I did do was I found the person making the decision. What's their basis? Where is that a legitimate point of view to have in what they were doing and what the announced policy was? And if I could find that nugget, then I was OK with it. Right. I was OK with it. I, you know. Stem cell research was the example for me for the Bush administration. I would have made a different decision, but I'm not the president. But I understood where he was coming from and why he was making the decision he made to, to fund stem cell research for the first time ever by the federal government. I got it. I had no trouble defending that position then as a result. So th I think that's what's important to know is, is you got to find that. Now, if it's impossible, if it's absolutely impossible to do, then you either have to resign or you have to to hand the ball to somebody else who does it. And those are both options that feel perfectly legitimate too. So anyway. Great, thank you, Bill. Um, Darren. Yes, I really do not have too much to add other than to say that um, advocacy, especially advocating for yourself takes a certain amount of courageousness. Um, I think it's um, important that you find your own voice and your own style. Uh, over the years, I've really had to em embrace me as a person um, and, um, and, and to make sure that I'm authentically being me because mm -hmm. I've found in the past that trying to um, assimilate and become something that I'm not, um, I, I don't come off as well, right? Um, I think all of us can tell when someone is trying a little too hard to fit, um, if they're a square person to fit into a round peg, so to speak. So um, find your style to um, go back to what Ellen said, um, you know, evaluate uh, who you are as a person and um, how you're authentically navigating the world. And I think that, um, oh, and lastly, be courageous in um, um, advocacy for yourself. Uh, I'm very passionate about children and youth, for instance, and I'll go over and beyond, um, particularly for at-risk youth. Uh, but I found a few years ago that I wasn't advocating with that same level of tenacity for my best interests. So um, I, I encourage, um, especially women who are more keen to do this, to um, become relentless when it comes to self-advocacy and doing what is um, in your best interest. Um, be as passionate about yourself as you are about the work. Right, thank you, that's excellent. I will give two uh, you know, potential, there is a, two potential things to read. Um, there are a, a couple of publications and I went to a seminar uh, oh, 10 years ago in the Obama administration about uh, hard conversation, that, hard conversations that's out by uh, Harvard Press. And to build on what Darren was saying, practice. If you have to have a hard conversation, have it with someone you trust, say it out loud. Even mm -hmm. if you're an in-person uh, native uh, on difficult conversations, they're hard. And so you should do that, have, a, have some practice. Um, and Deborah Tannen um, has written uh, a lot on uh, uh, the, the place and, the, and the, um, the, the binds that women find themselves in, in these kinds of conversations. So, uh, so there are two, um, two options for this group. Bill Pierce, Darren Ellerby, this has been a terrific conversation. I feel like it could have gone even longer. I appreciate you both. 
Um, and I know that all who are on this uh, should be able to follow up with uh, Pitt's Office of uh, Alumni Affairs and uh, look forward to the next time we can get together and solve all of our challenges. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Thank you Alan. Thank you, Darren. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone. Hail the Pitt. H2.